Radar Report. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. There are so many things coming together right now and we've been covering a lot of them especially in our last video we had to cover a lot of material because there's so many things coming together. There's been a lot of things that the Lord has shown us along our learning journey, different backstory, different contexts, different celestial signs even, and just more about constellations, their meaning, how the heavens work. He showed us different parts along the way, different nuggets and treasures. But now, approaching a two-year anniversary of the Revelation 12 sign, when we see the story and suddenly we can see how all the pieces come together and the events on the celestial clock are all coming together now too. It's all coming together quickly. The Lord has prepared us ahead of time with our learning, with our knowledge, with what we're even looking at. And so we could see not just what's going on in the heavens, but we've also seen in God's Word. We've studied those pictures, and so now we have a deeper and richer understanding of the time because of how the Lord has led us and He has guided us to this point. And so just like the story of the wise men, when we see what's coming together, how quickly it's coming together, we have exceeding great joy, not just because of what particular celestial signs we're seeing. We're excited because... Wow, the Lord has brought us on an incredible learning journey so that I can actually understand what I'm looking at. I can see the time because he's shown us so many pictures. He's shown us so many things from his word. This is why we're so excited at this time. It's not because necessarily what we see, but of how we got here and who has led us and who has been our guide and who has been the one showing us these things. Our Redeemer has shown us so many things. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the more that we study the one, we'll learn more about the other. And so it's been a beautiful tapestry of redemption, enriching our knowledge and understanding and our appreciation of our redemption when we do look up, when we do lift up our heads, and we do see that our redemption draweth nigh. On top of all the particular celestial signs and meteorological signs and agricultural signs, there's also the fauna signs with the doves leaving at this time. Beautiful pictures. We are awaiting a beloved who is mine and I am his. And he is the one we are awaiting. He is the one we are calling to, even at this time, of telling him, Hurry up! Come! Run to me! Just like John finishes the book of Revelation, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We're at a time where this is our heart cry. Our body is groaning for the adoption of the new body, but also for our Redeemer, the one who loved us first. And we're at a time where the doves have already started their migration. They're already starting to leave. We've been studying different departure pictures. And I've been trying to find out and nail down exactly when is the period for the doves there in Israel. And pretty much it's a little vague. They all basically say about the midst of August. That's when they're going to be starting their migration. Through the rest of August and September they'll be migrating. Pretty much by October they're gone. And that's the best that I could find out from a number of different sources. But we're definitely at a time where they are starting to leave. This is a time that marks they are starting to leave. And that goes right with so many other pictures that we've been looking at. So many things telling us two celestial signs going on right now. That coincide again with the meteorological pictures, the agricultural pictures, the fauna pictures, the celestial pictures, the biblical pictures. It's all coming together right here. Multiple things pointing and saying, Your redemption draweth nigh, your bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. You have full expectation that he is at the very door right now. You see the day approaching. You see also that time is very short. On the one hand, we see the son over at Leo the lion treading on the head of the serpent. And then not too further down along the line, part of the same story, again going from the head to the tail, both these are connected, two parts of the same story, we see Jupiter the king planet still pretty much parked right over Scorpius, the heart of the scorpion. Not further down on the scorpion, but where the vitals are, the heart and the main body of the scorpion is at. So we see two things emphasizing and treading, making his enemies his footstool. And over Jupiter's path recently, I've been trying to take pictures when we've had clear sky just to document what is Jupiter doing. And Jupiter and Scorpius is very easily visible in the evening sky, looks south about an hour after the sun sets. It's right there. It's hard to miss. You don't need binoculars. You don't need telescopes to see it. This sign is declared readily visible for the world to see at this time. And then, of course, the sun's parked right over and pointing straight at Leo the Lion, too. But because of the cloud conditions, I've only been able to take a few pictures. And pretty much while Jupiter's parked, I didn't bother taking too many pictures because it wasn't going anywhere. But I did take this one on August 5th, pretty much a day after it had started standing still there. So I knew pretty much it was going to be staying in that spot for almost two weeks. So that was August 5th. And I did happen to take one also on August 16th, which was pretty close to the end of Station 2, but it was still pretty much at Station 2. It had not moved at all visually. 
and then I got to take one the other day on August 21st, a few days after it had supposedly started moving again. But because of its movement, even though it is technically moving, it's creeping along. It's basically going in first gear. It's not traveling very fast after it has stopped. It's just going in slow gear. But it's slowly going to be picking up speed over the days ahead. But by the 21st, it barely had moved from where it was. So I was kind of curious, just with the few pictures that I took, would I be able to see how much Jupiter moved? So I just brought it into the computer and tried to overlay all these pictures just to see how much has Jupiter moved from the background stars. So I put in a blue line there that pretty much marks the ecliptic very close to it where Jupiter is going to be going in the direction now, going leftward in prograde motion. So that just gives me a little comparison note of the direction I should be expecting it to be going. It should be going toward the left if it's moving at all. So this was August 5th, but then I put in another line between one of the main stars in Ophiuchus and then Antares, and this just gives me a reference line to see does Jupiter move away from these lines? How much does it move along? So that's August 5th when it was at Station 2, so it's not moving anywhere. And then on August 16th, it's still at Station 2. And again, I don't have the best crispest camera, so there's going to be a super slight shuffle, but you can tell it hasn't really moved at all. But then by August 21st, you can see, yes, it has moved a smidgen. Just over those few days from the 16th to the 21st, it has moved a smidgen, barely. It's still pretty close to standing in the same area, even though we can tell it is moving. It's still pointing to that same picture that was pointed to over those previous weeks. Just comparison again, here's the 5th, the 16th, the 21st. You can see it moved a little bit there. And then if I stack them up on top of each other, you can tell it's moved just a little bit. Not almost half of a glowing dot of Jupiter. So it's barely moving still. Again, moving almost in first gear, barely. So we need to keep this in mind when we look at the clock where we are right now. It's still pointing to that same picture of the standing and the Wiseman events and then what happened after. It's not in a hurry to get away from that story. That's still being emphasized right now for a short time. And of course the sun won't be treading on Hydra the Serpent for a long time either. That's what we need to keep in mind. That's what we're going to cover today too. These signs, these times are super short. They won't last too much longer at all before the entire story changes. We see the day approaching. What day approaching? When he's going to be making his enemies his footstool. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And we've been studying how this is connected to the rapture. And we've also noted the connection and the emphasis even of the celestial bodies here in this same chapter too. They all go together. The story of the enemies being made a footstool, being put under their feet. And that's going to be portrayed in the heavens on the celestial clock. That's how we will see the day approaching. That's how we will know the time. That's how we know our redemption, the pickup, is drawing nigh. When we will say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Knowing the enemies is very important to understanding the time. From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. The more that we study this and understand who are the enemies, what is the next chapter, our Lord is waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. That's the next chapter. And so the more that we understand who are these enemies who are going to be made the footstool, we can also see them on the celestial clock and also see when the clock is pointing to that enemy is now going to be made a footstool at this time. That's why we can see the day approaching when we know what is the next chapter and who are his enemies. And then we will look on the clock to see if it's pointing to those stories and to that time in a context of time, an expected time, the last generation time, which is where we are, which is where we are expecting to see these. And when we've seen these things begin to come to pass, we've looked up, we've lifted up our heads, and we've seen an incredible tapestry of redemption. But today we're going to look a little bit more into who are his enemies. Let's make sure who are his enemies to make sure we are looking at the picture correctly in the heavens. So who is our Redeemer's enemies? That goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. The very first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Several incredible pictures here that define from the very beginning of history almost who is the Redeemer's adversary, who is his enemy, who is at enmity with him. Spells it out, the serpent, that's who he's directly addressing. There's going to be enmity, there's going to be hatred between you and the woman, and between her seed, who is the one who's going to be born of a virgin. It, Messiah, her seed, shall bruise thy head. In our last video we talked about bruising as the idea of crushing. It's really making a bloody pulp. 
And this is prophesied from the very beginning of our Bibles that one day the Redeemer, the Messiah, will bruise, just absolutely crush the head of his enemy. Who is his enemy? The serpent. So we need to keep this in mind. When we read later prophecy and later pictures, it assumes we have read the beginning and we have read up through where we are now. And that's how we get the best understanding. We understand the backstory. What is the backstory of our redemption and of our Redeemer? Who is his enemies? Who is he going to be making his footstool? It's going to be the serpent. And take note that the prophecy deals specifically with, you will know this is fulfilled because he's going to be bruising, he's going to be crushing the head of the serpent. Not the tail region of the serpent, the head. This is how you will know the picture is fulfilled and being applied. You will see an application to the head of a serpent. And thou shalt bruise his heel. The serpent bruised the heel of Messiah when he came. He was offered on the cross. He was bruised for our iniquity. Remember, he was beaten to where he was not even recognizable. He was crushed. But it was only, in a sense, bruising his heel because he rose from the dead. He was bruised, but it wasn't a mortal wound. But the seed of the woman will bruise the head. It will be a mortal wound to the serpent. And this is a picture we need to look for when we look up and we lift up our heads. When is the seed of the woman, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who sprang out of Judah, when is he going to bruise and crush the head of the serpent? Because that is the picture of the next prophetic chapter. Now this is in Genesis. So this story, this prophecy, this promise will be passed down through many generations. In Job 9.9 we see it talked about, Which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Job was contemporary with Abraham. He lived at the same time. Sometimes Christians today have the idea that Old Testament characters were not as smart as they were today. They were very smart. They knew far more about astronomy and the story that is depicted in the heavens than we do today, unfortunately. So it's been more of a learning journey for us. But scripture records how they knew what the heavens declared. They knew the constellations. They were far more familiar with what God put up there. The chambers of the south, we've emphasized this several times. When you look toward the south, that's where the ecliptic is highest in the sky. That's where the best demonstration and rehearsal will be seen as the ecliptic rotates through the day. And so the chambers, the areas of the ecliptic along the south, that's where you have the best view of the story. And that's what we're seeing right now. An hour after sunset, it's right there. Hard to miss. Jupiter treading on the head of the adversary. It depicts a twofold story. Just like the scorpion can only wound the heel of a person, that part has been fulfilled. But the serpent is still going to be wrestled, and by putting his foot on the same, he's also portraying the second chapter too. And that's what we see depicted right now in the chambers of the south. Very clearly, one of the best places to see it, the best time of the year to see it too. It's declared at this time in the chambers of the south. Further along in Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. You know, Job knew about a Redeemer that was prophesied to come. He knew he was the living. And he knew things prophetically about the future. Because he knew there was a story declared in the heavens. He could look up. He knew that there would be a Redeemer that would come. And in a sense, he was already victorious. It just had to happen. But the story was already written. The conclusion was already written. And Job, from the celestial heavens, he already knew that he will stand at the latter day upon the earth. He will be victorious over his enemies. Because he will make them his footstool. Job 26.13, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. This needs to catch our attention. What was the very first prophecy about? It was about a serpent. And here Job recognized, yes, God is the one who garnished the heavens. He arranged the stars in the heavens to even form the crooked serpent. Job knew exactly where the crooked serpent was depicted in the heavens. He also knew it was under a lion. He knew the story was portrayed and pointed to in the heavens. It was a prophecy back in the Garden of Eden, but it is also spelled out in the sky, too, by the Creator. And this is what needs to impress upon us. The heavens declare the glory of God. God already knew the story. The more that we understand the story, the more we can see it in what our Creator garnished the heavens deliberately on purpose with. 
And it can remind us of Isaiah 40. Lift up your eyes and behold all these things. Our Creator spells out the story and He wants us to look up at it. It's on His clock for a reason. He wants us to look at it. Job 38:31. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Mazaroth in his season, or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? God was dialoguing with Job here, because he knew Job knew these celestial constellations, he knew these stories, he knew these names. Canst thou bring forth Mazaroth? That's the collection of constellations along the ecliptic. Job was very familiar with what our Creator put there, and the story behind it, too. Of course, David was. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Verse 4, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. The Maseroth, which travels along that line, it declares a story. Their words reach all parts of the world. We can see the story of our Redeemer and his enemies on that line, in the heavens that our Creator garnished. In that same chapter, after he had looked up at what the heavens declared, it ended his thought and conclusion was, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The Redeemer hadn't even come yet. It was just a promise like Abraham. They knew that he would send a Redeemer. He would send a lamb. But it was as good as done because they already knew the story. It was declared in the heavens. And this is what we need to see when we look up too. It's a story of our Redeemer and what he is going to do. Isaiah 26, we've been studying and looking at this passage. And we have seen the correlations to the rapture. The calling into the chambers for safety right before the day of indignation starts. Right before he starts making his enemies his footstool. And in chapter 27, verse 1, In that day the Lord with a sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan the piercing serpent, that is serpents, even Leviathan the crooked serpent, that is Hydra, the crooked serpent that Job talked about. And again, it catches our attention. These are right next to each other, tip to tail. The twofold story of Ophiuchus wrestling serpents and being attacked by Scorpius, it touches directly the crooked serpent of Hydra. The crooked serpent that Job knew was declared in heaven. And so we can see these pictures when we look up. He shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. That is Draco. And Stellarium depicts it more as a land dragon, but that is incorrect. It is long viewed and more understood as a water serpent. A serpent dragon. A fiery serpent dragon, as Eratus talks about in his Phenomena, a very popular book at the time of the New Testament church. They knew what the fiery red dragon was. Serpents and Hydra are both viewed as aspects of Draco because they are along the ecliptic different parts of Draco's story. They are seen as different chapters of it. Draco's up at the north near Polaris overseeing everything, but serpents and Hydra are seen as aspects of Draco. So when you attack serpents and Hydra, you are attacking Draco. Which reminds us from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, you attack all the aspects of Draco, you get them all at the same time. And that's what he's talking about in verse 1. He's not just attacking an enemy. He's attacking all aspects of that enemy too. All of his influence. He's attacking it and making it all under his feet. He's making it all his footstool. It's a complete bruising. A complete crushing of the head of the serpent. This is what was prophesied. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The treading down the enemy and making him under his feet, making him his footstool, it's going to be applying his feet to his head. And that is a picture throughout Old Testament prophecy. We know the enemies. We even know that they are clearly depicted in the heavens. So now that we have a clear idea of the enemy, we can clearly look on the clock and see it up there. It is declared in the heavens. It's garnished. It's put there on purpose for us to look up, to lift up our eyes, and to see it. So we will know our redemption, the one who was bruised for our iniquities. He, the same person who was born of a virgin, the line of the tribe of Judah, he's about to make his enemies his footstool. And that's how we can see the time. That's how we can know the time. That's how we can see the day approaching. Because we know it's spelled out along the line what he's going to be doing. And it will only be at a certain time. So you will know distinctly what time it is. Now, this is very interesting when we consider the time we are at. We're approaching a two-year mark of the Revelation 12 sign. And if you remember Revelation chapter 12, who is the enemy depicted in that chapter? It is a fiery red dragon, the dragon serpent. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, 
called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. It tells us straight up, this is the great dragon, the same one talked about by Isaiah. Draco, the fiery water serpent, the serpent that is in the sea, which Draco is long understood, he's swimming around in the sea. The great dragon, who, in case you didn't notice, he is the old serpent. That goes all the way back to Genesis, the very old serpent, the very old adversary. Same guy. In case you're still confused, he's called the devil and Satan. Same guy, same different aspects, whether it's in serpents, Hydra, Draco, same guy. The great dragon, that old serpent, Draco, which is manifested in the aspects of serpents and Hydra. That is part of the story, Revelation 12, that we have seen and the Lord drew our attention to two years ago. So what are we looking up at now? We are looking up at the other two aspects that go with that same story. Remember, he said he's going to be attacking the piercing serpent, which is serpents. He's going to be attacking the crooked serpent, which is Hydra, and the serpent that is in the sea, which is Draco. We're at a time now where all three of these are being addressed. Serpents in Ophiuchus, Hydra under Leo, both aspects of Draco, which is involved from the celestial sign that drew a lot of our attention back on September 23rd with the Revelation chapter 12 sign that talks specifically about it. We're now at a time that is pointing to the story of all three. This needs to catch our attention, the time we are at right now when we understand the backstory and who is the enemy and how are they depicted in the heavens. And as we've studied the prophetic events associated with this sign have not happened yet, even though we've seen a sign that fits and matches the Revelation 12 sign, but we've also studied from Scripture how that is part of the prophetic story. This sign, the Revelation 12 sign, will be revisited. Like Jesus told the disciples, there's going to be a time of perplexity when the tribulation starts. All the nations are going to be filled with perplexity. There's going to be some extremely perplexing events happening, people not being able to die being one of the more obvious ones. There's going to be a time of perplexity that is tied to the lying wonders that the serpent, the devil, and Satan is allowed to bring onto the earth. When he is unrestrained, he is not unrestrained yet. These events will be revisited. If you want to study more on our Bible study, look at Time of Perplexity, our PDF resource link in the description box. We are at a time right now where prophecy, the celestial signs we've seen, time, so many things pointing to where we are right now. And it catches our attention that these celestial markers and pointing to serpents and at the same time hydra, that's only for a short time. The sign telling us the day is approaching is only for a very short time, which tells us that time is very short. The time of indignation is about to start. Definitely study the timeline. I've updated it and expanded it a little bit so we can have a better view of where we are. Again, you can find a link in the description box. We have two timelines. We have the smaller view of just several months. We often refer to that as the timeline. But we also have a multi-page that goes all the way back to the Revelation 12 sign. So that way we can see the context. We have seen a lot of celestial signs since then. We also before that with Shiloh and Leo the Lion. But I encourage you, if you have the time, review the multi-page timeline. Just get a view of how is this time where we are now? How is it different? We see so many things coming together. Parts of the story where now the celestial clock is pointing to two enemies that really bring in the story of the third. We're here at a two-year mark where all three are now involved. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights of the timeline when we look at it. Again, time is so very short. We've seen multiple things come together in the past few days that have really highlighted this time here why the sun as a bridegroom is pointing to Leo the lion, particularly as it started walking down the head of Hydra, and it's still walking down that particular area. We've studied summer, the time of the doves leaving, the vintage time, so many things here that are only here for a short amount of time, particularly the vintage time. We talked about how it started the first week of August, and it's pretty much going to be wrapping up toward the first week of September. This picture is already going on now. The grapes are already being harvested right now. They have been harvested for a few weeks now. Being pressed, the wine being pressed out right now. This vintage picture is strong right now, but it's going to be tapering off in the weeks ahead. And Golden Wines, which is in northern Israel, they have their annual harvest party scheduled for September 12th. And we had noted before that they were still doing some harvesting in the first week of September back in 2017, but the emphasis was that those were still smaller select varieties. The bulk had already been done. Apparently, by the time of their harvest party, they're pretty much wrapped up. They're pretty much done. 
So again, when we look at that, and we understand he's going to be treading on his enemies, putting them in the wine press of his fury, and all the other pictures with the blood and wine and grapes, all those pictures, there's only a window where this is applicable and really manifested and strong in the real world. Only for a certain time. Right at the time when the sun is pointing to Leo the lion, which tells us this picture will be running out soon. And we've seen how from about August 4th, when Jupiter started standing, that's when the sun really started walking down the head of Hydra, the crooked serpent, the very one named in prophecy. And right now, the sun is just a little bit past Regulus, almost to the midsection of Leo the Lion. And we can see, though, by September 12th, by then, the sun's pretty much going to be pointing at the hind legs, almost the tail of the lion. So the picture is going to be very weak at that point, and that's really when the sun starts getting about the midsection halfway of Hydra. Which if you're going to pounce on your enemy who's a snake, you really don't go for the middle. Where do you go for? Well, as a lion, you grab the first half, around the head preferably. That's the area you're going to be grabbing more with your front paws. You might stand on it a little bit with your hind paws, but the action is most expected toward the first half of Leo the lion. That's where that picture is strong guessed. So we got to keep that in mind when we look at this picture here. Where are these pictures the strongest? During the vintage time when he's going to be treading on the adversary and really busting his head open, bruising it and crushing it, where is that picture the strongest? While the sun is over the head area, at least the first half, of Hydra the Serpent. Understanding, though, that the strength of the picture really starts dropping off real quick. By September 12th, it's getting really iffy. And so we can see, just by looking at the clock, understanding that the Creator garnished the heavens. He put the crooked serpent up there. That very constellation that depicts the enemy that he's going to be treading on. The Bible says, yes, the Creator put it up there. So we know exactly what we're looking at, what we're looking for. And we can also see that that picture of treading on that particular enemy, particularly the head which is prophesied, it ain't going to be doing this for long. We're at a very short window of time right now. By September 1st, the sun is going to be at the midsection of Leo the Lion. So the picture could still be strong by then, because not till it gets to the hind feet of Leo the Lion around September 10th, that's when it's going to have been down half of the serpent. But September 1st is still at a good point. It's actually the midsection of Leo the Lion, so you could almost apply it to all the feet. It's, it's really jumping on the serpent. So any time between now and today, while it's still close to the forepaws, to the midsection, this picture is super strong. Right during a vintage time that's also portraying a bruising and a crushing too. So the more that we understand the pictures of who is being made a footstool, we can also see the picture of a crushing and that enemy at the same time. And we can see that, wow, this is not going to be depicted in the heavens for long. This sign is for a very certain time. We can see the day approaching and we're standing on top of it right now. And by looking at all these things, we can see, yes, there's a zone. There's a time frame where these signs, these descriptions of the enemy, the treading, the departure time, all of that, there's a time when these signs are super strong. And ever since Jupiter started standing, all these signs have been strong. It's been declared, this is a time to expect it to start. You have now entered a zone specifically depicting treading on the adversary. But you can also see this particular story is going to be fading off very, very soon. Where we are right now, today, is super strong. Like the wise men, this is why we can have exceeding great joy, not just from a particular sign that we see, but when we see the context. It's all coming together. Our journey has brought us here, and we see it all coming together here. This is a high time of expected departures. On the timeline, I have several notes. Why is this time so strong? The sun is right now at Leo's midsection. And we can see that several important pictures are strongly in play. Not weakly, strongly in play right now. The sun is pointing strongly to the seed of the woman, who is Messiah. It's not pointing to somebody else. It's pointing to Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who sprang out of Judah. The sun is right now at the primary frontal feet used to pounce, through the midsection. The sun is also the first one-third right now of Hydra, the specified head area that is going to be attacked by the seed of the woman, Messiah. By about September 10th, that's where we'll be at the half point. But right now, it's at the first one-third of Hydra, right in the head area. We see the dog days of summer are wrapping up for both Jerusalem and Izmir, Turkey area. We're at a prime time of even the colloquial summer, for the average person's understanding. We see that coming to close for the Israel region. It's a time of the vintage harvest and treading going on right now at peak activity. It's still going strong right now. It's running wide open. It's at peak activity right now. 
bright and morning star is still fresh on the scene, less than three weeks old, depending how you count it. That sign is still pretty fresh right now. And it's still rising as the morning star right now. It started less than three weeks ago. So it's still fresh and still connected with the sun, too, a lot at this time, with the morning, with the day dawning when the shadows flee away. And Jupiter is still essentially standing in the same area over Scorpius as we saw. It's barely moved. It's just traveling in first gear right now. And we are within a two-year time associated with the star standing and departures. So everything is right on time, and all the signs are strong right now. Being declared in the heavens right now, we see the day approaching. This is the expectation for it right here, where he's going to be treading on all three aspects of his enemies. But when we see the time that has peaked now, we also quickly see that it's going to quickly change to other stories. All these signs, all these celestial pointers and markers are going to quickly start pointing and doing other things. Particularly around September 10th, we start to see the celestial story and depictions are really iffy and they're really starting to fade off by September 10th. The story is drastically changing by then. And we have notes on the timeline there too. The sun by September 10th will be at Leo's hind feet. By this point, several important pictures are no longer in play. The sun is no longer at the primary frontal feet used to pounce on enemies. The sun is over one-third down the length of Hydra, almost pretty much halfway down the snake, away from the head area. By that point, September 10th, the dog days of summer will have been over for two weeks. And by September 10th, the colloquial summer for the average person in Israel would have ended a week prior. The vintage harvest and treading is essentially all done by that point. That picture is completely gone. The morning star itself is now approximately over a month old, which means it rises further and further away time-wise from the morning rising, the sun rise. There's a greater and greater disconnect between the two, even though it's a morning star, it's not closely as seen with the sunrise. And by September 10th, Jupiter will be noticeably moved from the standing area over Scorpius, and overall will be over or at the approximate upper limit of two years from the Revelation 12 sign, so outside the story outside of so many pictures, outside of all of it, really. And so this needs to catch our attention, not just what we see strongly in play right now, but also see how quickly it all changes, the story changes. And particularly by September 23rd, the sun's going to be starting to point at Virgo, the woman, which is a completely different story. The woman is not the one treading on the serpent. She's not our redeemer, no. So we can quickly see there are meteorological pictures that are no longer in play at that point, agricultural pictures that are no longer in play, fauna pictures that are no longer in play by especially the end of September. And then we see that even the celestial heavens are pointing to a different chapter in the story too. So where we are right now, we see there is a high time where this picture is strong, but then it quickly disappears. We see the day approaching because it is so strong right here. Pretty much where we are right now today, up through the first very few days of September. That picture is going to be strong, and then it's going to be vanishing, evaporating really quickly. And where we find ourselves also, we find the emphasis on the transition, the ending of summer. This needs to catch our attention to see right here. While the signs are strong, the pictures are strong, the celestial time and the meteorological pictures, the agricultural pictures, why it's all going strong and wide open, we find it's also right at the time when the summer is wrapping up right during that summertime, that time of expectation of when our redemption draweth nigh. Everything's right on time. This is why we have exceeding great joy. It's all right on time. Around August 27th, that's going to be the end of the dog days of summer for Jerusalem. It's latitude. About a week after that would be the end of Izmir, Turkey's dog days of summer. So we still have that on the calendar, even though it does appear the prophetic mention of summer was made from a Jerusalem perspective. We'll still keep the Izmir, Turkey one on there. But we also see from a celestial calendar and the start of the next biblical month, the start of the seventh month, that also ends the three months of summer. And we've talked about for the average Hebrew person, really the fourth month, fifth month, and the sixth month, those three months were considered summer for the average person. That started the summer months. And that's very similar to us on Gregorian calendars in similar latitudes. We'll sometimes consider June, July, and August summer. We'll just kind of colloquially describe them as summer, those three. It's your generalized understanding. And the same for them. They view those three months, the fourth, fifth, and sixth, as summer. So, again, it catches our attention on the celestial clock when it starts the seventh month that's ending the sixth and last month of summer. Right here at this expected time, which is just a few hours before the biblical calendar to your anniversary of Revelation 12 sign, which commemorated the birthday 
of the one who is born of a woman, the line of the tribe of Judah, right when the son is pointing at the very same thing. And just like other events in the Bible, they are recorded by the biblical month and the biblical day. And so that's why we are using that for a two-year anniversary, not the Gregorian. The birthday happened at a specific time and month on the celestial clock, and that's what we're looking at. So much coming together right here, and time quickly running out, though. Where we are with the sign strong right now today, while you are watching this, but up through September 1st, it will be very strong, but then it's going to quickly be going away. We're at a high time, so much telling us that time is short. And just like the wise men, when they saw the star standing, their departure happened sometime real quickly after they saw the star standing. Again, we don't know whether it's days or hours, but knowing that culture, it does appear that it's multiple days. And also when we read the account, Herod, when he realized he was mocked of the wise men, apparently he found out a little bit after it was too late for him to do anything about it. Apparently he gave them some time and then realized they're not showing up. Where are they? And by then it was too late. They were gone. So apparently the two-year part of the story came into play a little bit after the wise men and Mary and Joseph had already left town. So that's what we need to keep in mind also with this two-year mark. I'm not looking to the two-year mark. The two-year mark happened sometime after the departures. So keep that in mind. We're expecting our departures to be called into the chamber sometime before a two-year mark, particularly one so strongly pointed on a calendar pointed to in reference to the enemies. We see a day approaching. We also see that time is very short. Definitely stay the timeline. There is so much information on there. So many Bible verses. Be reminded of it while we are looking at this time. We see that time is running out in so many ways. As we are reminded to be looking for our Redeemer and that he is about to make his enemies his footstool, we see that time is short. And so we must apply ourselves to what has our Redeemer instructed us. The very book, Revelation, that talks about the Revelation 12 sign and the enemy, Draco, the fiery serpent, also has instructions at the very beginning for the churches. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. There are particular notes at the beginning that are just for the churches including the drawing nigh to him and supping with him. Our Lord and our Redeemer, he wants us to be ready. He wants us to be watching, to be praying, and to be preparing ourselves and to be making ourselves ready. When he comes, he wants to find us with our lights burning, our loins girded about, us still occupying till he comes, doing what we are supposed to be doing for the kingdom till he comes. Not just in service to him and watching for him, but in also watching ourselves purifying and sanctifying ourselves, washing our feet. Like our own Redeemer emphasized to Peter, you are washed, you are every whit clean, but you still need to wash your feet as you go through this life. The emphasis that here, in this present world, we still need to live righteously, godly, in this present world, keeping ourselves unspotted from the world, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Every man that hath this hope in him, that we're going to see him face to face, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. These are the pictures that are given to us, the instructions for us, especially the hope when we have the exceeding great joy of seeing him very soon. Let's purify and sanctify ourselves, watch our playlist. Let us review, let us have an ear to hear everything that the Spirit saith unto the churches, what he desires to see in our life. Let us run for the prize, let us finish strong, let us encourage one another unto love and to good works. Let's pray for each other. If you have a prayer request, share it in the comments below. We will pray for you. And I encourage others, get alongside them, encourage them, encourage each other in the comment section. Now is the time, as we see the day approaching, let us so much the more encourage one another, provoke one another, and exhort one another unto love and to good works. And let's be a demonstration of it with Jesus Christ shining in our life as we put on the armor of light, as we put on our Lord Jesus Christ. We have heard so many things telling us, Your bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. He is almost over the hill right now. He is nigh at the door. Go ye out to meet him. So let's rise up. Let's trim our lamps. Let's shine bright. Let's put on the armor of light. Let's put on our Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, so that he is seen in our life, bringing glory to our Father as we draw nigh to him, supping with him, having an ear to hear our bridegroom, and going out to meet him, loving him, and serving him first and highest above all else. Maranatha.